In my investigation of speculative subgenres, I came across a subgenre I've never heard before, Banksian fantasy. I read the definition in Wikipedia and thought, that's super niche. Have I read any Banksian fantasy novels before? I mean, there are so few books listed under this category, it made me wonder if we were all getting punked. Then I saw one of the titles and realized, oh yeah, I guess I have read a Banksian fantasy and it was one of my favorite series, so I need to find out more. Because I am Daisy X Machina, the drag queen detective who investigates all things speculative in the realm of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. So you may be asking, what is Banksian fantasy? Excellent question. Banksian fantasy is broadly defined as a story set in the afterlife. Now, because of the subgenre's namesake, it also sometimes is defined as including famous historical characters meeting in the afterlife and or being humorous. So now you may be asking, who is this subgenre's namesake? Another excellent question. It is John Kendrick Bangs, who was a fairly prolific American writer from the 1880s through the 1920s, and one series of books he wrote was known as the Associated Shades series about a men's club in Hades. The first book in the series is called A Houseboat on the Styx, published in 1895. Now, John Kendrick Bangs didn't invent the idea of a humorous story set in hell with historical figures, but he did popularize the concept as his books were bestsellers at the time. So, of course, I had to read at least one of those books. Since they were published so long ago, guess what? They're free. If you're interested in them, go to Project Gutenberg for an ebook copy or Librivox for a free audiobook. But are they worth reading? I can only speak to the first book, A Houseboat on the River Styx, and I had no idea what to expect. I will say, this isn't a novel per se. In fact, it's a stretch to call it a novel. Rather, maybe it's a collection of short stories in the same setting, and some of the same characters come in and out of each story. And then again, I'm not even sure short story is the right word. I mean, it's fiction and short, but there's no real plot. Mostly, the chapters are simply conversations among famous historical or fictional dead people. The first chapter is really the only one that has any sort of plot, but it's to set the stage for what's to come. Sharon is this old guy on the river Styx, chartering shades or dead people through the afterlife. He's been doing this forever and pretty much has a monopoly on the riverboat business. That is, until he sees a fancy houseboat on the river. The houseboat is filled with famous men like Sir Walter Raleigh, Shakespeare, Confucius, Socrates, and so on, and they reveal themselves to be a men's club called the Associated Shades and hire Sharon to be the janitor on their club's houseboat. Now, if this sounds ridiculous, <laughs> it is. Each chapter from then on is usually about famous people getting into arguments, like Emperor Nero teasing Shakespeare that he never wrote any of his plays, saying maybe Lord Bacon did, so they have to call over Bacon to learn the truth. And yeah, it gets super silly. Baron Munchausen is featured in a lot of the stories, first appearing in the chapter where George Washington throws a dinner party, and there's social satire and a lot of slapstick. Munchausen was apparently one of the favorite characters when it was published, and Bangs wrote an entire Associated Shades book featuring Munchausen called Baron Munchausen. My favorite chapter was the second to the last. It was called As to Saurians and Others, where P.T. Barnum is complaining to Noah that he didn't save any dinosaurs, which would have been great attractions for his circus. 
and it practically turns into a Monty Python skit. I mean simply this, that to make a show interesting, said Mr. Barnum, a man has got to provide interesting materials, that's all. I do not mean to say a word that is in any way derogatory to your morality. You were a surprisingly good man for a sea captain, and with the exception of that one occasion when you, ah, uh, you allowed yourself to be stranded on the bar, if I may so put it, I know of nothing to be said against you as a moral temperate person. That was only an accident, said Noah, reddening. You can't expect a man six hundred odd years of age. Certainly not, said Raleigh, soothingly. And nobody thinks less of you for it. Considering how you must have hated the sight of water, the wonder of it is that it didn't become a fixed habit. Let us hear what it is that Mr. Barnum does criticise in you. His taste, that's all, said Mr. Barnum. I contend that, compared to the animals he might have had, the ones he did have were as anthills to Alps. There were more magnificent zoos allowed to die out through Noah's lack of judgment than one likes to think of. Take the Proterosaurus, for instance. Where on earth do we find his equal today? You ought to be mighty glad you can't find one like him, put in Adam. If you'd spend a week in the Garden of Eden with me, with lizards eight feet long dropping out of the trees onto your lap while you were trying to take a Sunday afternoon nap, you'd be willing to dispense with things of that sort for the balance of your natural life. If you want to get an idea of that experience, let somebody drop a calf on you some afternoon. I'm not saying anything about that, returned Barnum. It would be unpleasant to have an elephant drop on one after the fashion of which you speak, but I'm glad the elephant was saved just the same. I haven't advocated the Proterosaurus as a Sunday afternoon surprise, but as an attraction for a show. I still maintain that a lizard as big as a cow would prove a lodestone, the drawing powers of which the pocket money of the small boy would be utterly unable to resist. Then there was the Iguanodon. He'd have brought a fortune to the box office. Which you'd have immediately lost, retorted Noah, paying rent. When you get a reptile of his size that reaches 30 feet up into the air when he stands on his hind legs, the ordinary circus wagon of commerce can't be made to hold him, and your menagerie room has to have ceilings so high that every penny he brought to the box office would be spent storing him. "'Mischievous, too,' said Adam, that Iguanodon. "'You couldn't keep anything out of his reach. "'We used to forbid animals of his kind to enter the garden, "'but that didn't bother him. "'He'd stand up on his hind legs and reach over and steal anything he'd happened to want. "'I could have used him for a fire escape,' said Mr. Barnum. "'And as for my inability to provide him with quarters, "'I'd have met that problem after a short while.' I've always lamented the absence, too, of the Megalosaurus. Which simply shows how ignorant you are, retorted Noah. Why, my dear fellow, it would have taken the whole of an ordinary zoo such as yours to give the Megalosaurus a lunch. Those fellows would eat a rhinoceros as easily as you'd crack a peanut. I did have a couple of Megalosaurians on my boat for just twenty-four hours, and then I'd chuck them both overboard. If I'd kept them ten days longer, they'd have eaten every blessed beast I had with me, and your zoo wouldn't have had anything else but Megalosaurians. Papa is right about that, Mr. Barnum, said Shem. The whole Saurian tribe was a fearful nuisance. About four hundred years before the flood, I had a pet Creosaurus that I kept in our barn. He was a cunning little devil, full of tricks and all that, but we never could keep a cow or a horse on the place while he was about. They'd mysteriously disappear, and we never knew what became of them, until one morning we surprised Fido in— Surprised who? asked Dr. Johnson scornfully. Fido, returned Shem. That was my Creosaurus's name. Lord save us! 
Fido? cried Johnson. What a name for a Creosaurus! Well, what of it? asked Shem angrily. You wouldn't have us call a mastodon like that Fanny, would you? Or Tatters? So are there actually any books that can fall into this fantasy subgenre? There's not many. But I did mention there is one series of books that I have read, which is one of my favorites, and hardcore sci-fi fantasy fans probably already know what books I'm going to mention. Yes, River World by Philip Jose Farmer. The first River World book, To Your Scattered Bodies Go, was published in 1971 and features the main character of Sir Francis Bacon, the explorer, so it checks the box of famous people. He wakes up in a new body in a world with a river that seems to go on forever. People are resurrected all along the river from all over the world from different periods of time, so it's everything from Neanderthals to aliens who crash-landed on Earth in the 21st century. So we have an afterlife of sorts. But is it humorous? Well, I laughed. There's some really dark humor, like the couple who have been married for decades. They try to kill each other the moment they are resurrected. Over the next 10 years or so, Farmer wrote a total of five Riverworld books, To Your Scattered Bodies Go in 71, which won the Hugo, The Fabulous Riverboat, also published in 71, The Dark Design in 1977, The Magic Labyrinth in 1980, and Gods of Riverworld in 1983. It was made into a really bad miniseries in 2010 by the Sci-Fi Channel, and you can skip that. I think Riverworld is one of the most imaginative concepts I've come across for a series, but now that I've read John Kendrick Bangs' book, A Houseboat on the Sticks, I can definitely see a correlation between the two stories. Let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if Philip Jose Farmer's Riverworld was inspired by Bangs' Associated Shade series. There's also an anthology series called Heroes in Hell, edited by Janet Morris. The first anthology published in 1986. I definitely recognize that cover and believe I may have read it back in the day, but I can't remember anything about it. But it is short stories from some well-known authors, including Gregory Benford, C.J. Cherry, David Drake, that is in the Banksian fantasy subgenre. There certainly are satirical TV shows and movies that could fit into this Banksian fantasy subgenre, especially if you don't include historical figures. I'm thinking of Defending Your Life, my favorite Albert Brooks movie with Meryl Streep, where two characters meet in this way station city in the afterlife and fall in love. The TV sitcom The Good Place is, I think, a hilarious satire on the afterlife that I actually found quite profound at times, even though it was over-the-top absurd. What Dreams May Come, the Robin Williams movie, was not funny, but a really good movie about the afterlife. Remember, this all started with John Kendrick Bangs way back in the 19th century, writing silly conversations among historical and fictional characters in the afterlife. I wonder what he would have thought if he knew his name would be turned into a subgenre. Can you think of any other Banksian fantasy books or movies or TV shows? Let me know down in the comments and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel especially if you want to see more videos like this. Until we meet again, may all the books you read and all the afterlives you explore be 